<laughs> All righty, let's get started here. Um, I got to find the down key here. There we go. So little disclosure things here. I don't know how much you guys know about ethics. I, 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 I'm having a hard time. Can you hear me pretty well? I'm going to move it to the other side. I don't know how much you guys know about ethics, but ethics actually falls under the philosophy department. I learned that uh, just the other day. I, I was a science and engineering major, so um, I, I, I really never took any philosophy. But that's where it goes. The, the other place that it falls under, uh, particularly at where I work, is the legal department. Uh, so I don't have a degree in jur jurisprudence, so I, I am not qualified to give any person legal advice during this talk. Um, Google University, I think I put that in the, uh, in the abstract. What that means is, uh, just like it says here, uh, I went out on the internet and read about this subject and uh, found out a lot of stuff that I really didn't know uh, when I started it. And uh, next, uh, I'm not I'm speaking as a representative of, of uh, uh, where I work. Um, I am the president-elect of the Houston Geologic Society, and I've had, um, I guess my wife pointed out to me, it's 35 years of experience as of this coming October. <laughs> Ethics. I love this picture. A good friend of mine uh, has supplied all of my photos, uh, and uh, she has taken this picture here. This is a La Copa field trip. I don't know if you can go down there anymore. It might be too dangerous. But it's a great field trip. You got to go see the salt well, and I, I like the haze. So that's kind of that's kind of where we're at. I like that. That's a great picture. Uh, definition of ethics. Golly. This is so so classic. It's don't do that. <laughs> um, is what it is, and um, but there's a lot more to it than that. Actually, um, if uh, we go down here, we can take a look. I, I went to the to the to the dictionary to get these. Yeah, the uh, the first one is here. It's a system of moral principles, ethics of a culture. Uh, here's another one where you can, it's a, a conduct recognized in respect to particular class of human action, particular group, um, like medical ethics or Christian ethics. Um, then you have another one, moral principles as an individual, his ethics forbade, betrayal is not true. But the one that's really pertinent to me is number four here. It's a branch of philosophy, deals with values relating to human conduct with respect to right, wrong, good, bad, and the motives and ends of such actions. Um, this is what it really is. So moving right along here. Uh, ethics versus morals. This, this one was a real challenge for me. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize we were going to be connecting these together. Uh, but, um, but they do. They fit together. You know, they're, hooked, they're hooked to the hip. And uh, you look at this, it's, it basically tells you the, the, the difference of them are ethics are external source, morals are your internal code of ethics. Generally speaking, something your parents taught you when you were growing up. And uh, we can do the comparison here. Uh, ethics is rules of conduct for a particular class of people, or for us, in, the, in our case, we're chief scientists. Uh, morals are our habits with respect to right and wrong and, and that. Where do they come from? It's a social system for ethics. It's, it's, it's your internal being for, for morals. And why do we do it? Well, because society says it's the right thing to do, or we believe uh, that we can break it between right and wrong. So the next question comes up, can someone be morally corrupt and still ethical? Uh, uh, in theory, the answer to this is, uh, is yes. <laughs> I found that hard to believe, but yes. And, uh, but I, like I said, I personally, I find that difficult. I would find it very difficult. Uh, and apparently Hunter S. Thompson did in his uh, landmark countercultural no novel uh, that portrays Raoul Duke at, from Doonesbury, Uncle Duke, that's where he came from. Uh, he's hanging out in Las Vegas with his ever-present attorney, Dr. Gonzo. Um, yes. If you haven't read this book, it's excellent. It's, it's, it's hilarious. Um, I, I really enjoyed it as a teenager. Uh, why would I want to bring him up? Uh, might be a good question, but uh, throughout the talk here, uh, if I think you're in a situation that is a legal issue, uh, 
Um, you find yourself in that, and and and, you, and I think that you should. If you find yourself in there, you should have your attorney riding shotgun with you, which is essentially what was going on in the uh, fear and loathing in Las Vegas story with uh, Raul Duke. He, he was so morally corrupt. He had to have his uh, attorney ride shotgun with him everywhere he went, stay out of trouble. Uh, I will. Uh, I lost my picture. I'm going to put his picture up. It'll flash on there to let you know that you need legal advice if you catch yourself in this situation. All right. Scott's story. Uh, I grew up in uh, Dayton, Ohio. It was a very blue collar town. Uh, Scott was one of my childhood friends, one of the smartest guys I've ever met. And uh, uh, he and I uh, went to undergraduate school. We went to school where we grew up there at Wright State. And, uh, and, and Scott was a sharp guy, became an engineer. <clears throat> and uh, now in the later part of my life here, I've been trying to reconnect with some of my old buddies from uh, that I grew up with. And uh, so one day I decided I would do it. I was bored picking data. My, my wrist hurt and I get a purple tunnel from clicking. Uh, uh, and so I Googled, uh, you know, Scott, materials in, well first I did Scott and a bunch of doctors came up. Uh, I won't give you his last name, but uh, then I uh, remembered he was a materials engineer and uh, looked him up and bingo, up comes Scott, materials engineer, he's a professor. Holy cow, I'm not surprised actually, he's really smart. He's a professor at the University of Northern Illinois and I just happened to be going to Chicago and so I hooked up with Scott and uh, he and I have been, you know, reminiscing a lot of things and I was asking what kind of things he taught at, uh, at the university and he brought up a subject that uh, I had taken at Rice and uh, so I'm at, Rice, I, I'm at Rice and I took this class it's called uh, engineering mathematics and what we're doing is we're studying uh, partial differential equations Fourier transforms like yada 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 you're doing it by hand these things are incredible they take five pages of math to do this thing. And about uh, three quarters of the way through, when you're doing these boundary value problems, you come to a point and it can go one of three ways, and you have to guess. You really you literally have to guess. And you go about another half page to find out if you made a right guess or wrong guess. So I'm taking this class that this, this guy's teaching at Rice. He's, he offers some of the hard, that was a challenging experience for me. Now, um, if I did well on an exam, all those kids did well. If I did bad, everybody you know, spread right out. But uh, so this exam comes out and I'm, I'm, I'm jazzed for it. They don't proctor exams over there. They give you a time take home exam. I used to have my wife proctor them for me. And, and this guy tells us, you know, 10 to 12, you're taking this exam on Saturday. So I do this, I take it. And I finish it right. I finish it right at noon. And I tell my wife, I said, you know, I think I really did well on this thing. I you have to sign on the back a little oath. You know, I it was real long. I kind of shortened it up to I did not cheat. <clears throat> and I turned it in. And uh, when I went to pick it up, I looked at it, and I, I had a 99 on it. And I thought, wow, this one. Hmm. I went home and I started looking at it, and I came to the conclusion that I actually hadn't missed anything at all. I'm like, what? I took it back. I went back and I said, hey, I got a hooker on this thing. You took one off. That guy accused me of cheating. And I was telling this story to Scott. And he goes, yeah, I know what he's mean. I know why he felt that way. And I said, I said, I said, I said, what do you mean? He says, he says, you know, I teach that same class. And 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 I said, I said, well, how many of your kids do you think are cheating? He goes, 80 or 90 percent. I said, look, Scott, these guys. They're going to get out. They're not going to know it. There's no value in cheating. It's, oh, they're not cheating to pass or cheating to get an A. I'm like, Scott, you don't have a cheating problem. You got an ethics problem. So there you go. This is where it starts, right there. At the university level, they need to be talking about these things. If you think that at the university level you got that problem, uh, then, uh, then this is where it starts. Um, and, uh, People who are cheating to get that A, those are the same people that bring us situations like Enron. I'm sure there has got to be somebody in this room here that at one point in time worked for those guys. I know I have at least four people in my office that worked for them. And then our, my favorite is the other end of the spectrum here is Dad Joyner. And so let's just review some of these things. Uh, uh, Enron. 
It was a huge company. Many of us that uh, worked at companies other than Enron remember going into staff meetings and having uh, the McKinsey Group put up all these results that companies are having. They had one company be way up here in the left corner. Yeah? It's like, nobody can get those kind of results under this situation. And then and they go, oh yeah, one of your competitors are. It turned out to be Enron. You know? Why? They were lying. Well, 2001 was really, they had financial concerns. They've been lying, they've been cooking the books and making up everything. And, 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 and these are the kind of things that, that develop and it just you know, starts with cheating in college and ends up cheating on the financials at your company. And then so uh, when you end up like uh, Jeff Skilling, and you're still, you're still in prison. The most unethical thing of that whole experience is the fact that Ken Lay was, 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 he was found guilty but not charged and he went down in his basement got on his, on his uh, jogging track and ran until he gave himself a heart attack and because he died with a heart attack before they, before they uh, gave him uh, the charge, to, gave him the uh, punishment portion of it, his family got to keep all that money. That's, that's unethical, but it's the law. So find yourself in that situation, you better have, uh, better have Gonzo with you. Dad Joyner, how many people know who I'm even going to talk about in here? Oh good, Dad Joyner, there he is. That's him, right there with the hat. He had a business model. I love this. When you go out there on Wikipedia and look this guy up, um, it's, uh, it's very entertaining to read his story. They say lie about it on there. Um, yeah, he had a business model. Pick an area with limited potential to find oil. Sell more than 100% of your working interest on that well. There you go, that doesn't sound very logical. Right? Drill a dry hole, nobody knows the difference. Huh. Until you find the second largest field in the lower 48 by random drilling, that, that really becomes a problem. Then, uh, holy cow, that was unexpected. I sold 150% of that thing. Hmm. The man over here, uh, I don't know if, uh, can I move the little cursor over here? I can't, I'm going to go out here and point to it. Because the smart guy here at the group was that guy right there. He caught on. <laughs> he caught on. <laughs> he had some money. He went out and bought all 150% of that. Said, I'm willing to pay a little extra to get that field. He caught on that it was a giant oil field. But yeah, don't do that. It's a bad idea. There are more places that you can get into legal trouble than I can list. That's fine. Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Huh? Oh, good. Keep me on track here. <laughs> okay, uh, let's try it here. You know, insider trading. Why is it that my uh, our Arco stock was so low and I just didn't sell it? That's because I'm involved in operations. I'm not allowed to sell because of that. Bribery. Oh, there's a bad one. Kickback schemes. That's another bad one. Embezzlement. Don't do that one. Sexual harassment, really bad. Oh, falsifying leading data, critical data, that's called fraud. Don't do that one either. And if you send it to them by mail or on the internet, it's called wire fraud. <laughs> Passing confidential data to your spouse or friend. Ooh, that's another bad one. This is the one I really find despicable. Physically moving the survey stake of your competitors well. So they drill it on your acreage. And then you don't find out until it's been the discovery. Holy cow, you gotta give that well to them. That's really bad. It's hard to prove though, if you go there at night. Oh, there we go. There's a Ronald Moody there. Uh, oh, yep, yeah. I'll move. He's telling you, you need your attorney with you if you find yourself in those situations. You know, uh, those of you that know me well will, will know that uh, my, my dad is probably my greatest hero. Um, and uh, he, was, uh, he worked for the Air Force uh, as, a, as an engineer. Um, but um, I uh, got this job. I, I lived in Dayton, Ohio, met my wife. We got married. We were in my driveway in my parents' house because that's where we were living just before we headed off into the big world. 
Uh, we packed up our car. It's a Volkswagen diesel Dasher, 1981. And uh, we were moving to San Francisco to work for Chevron. Yep, threw all of our stuff in the car. We're getting ready to pull out. My dad says, oh, just a minute. I need to talk to you for a minute. And this is some of that fatherly advice my dad told me. Uh, I, I really liked it. Uh, he told me that, you know, in the course of your career, John, you're going to see people engage in activities you know are wrong and illegal. He says they're going to rationalize their actions in a multitude of different ways. He says, and when the end comes down and the curtain falls, they will be, he didn't quite use it this way. I've, I've made it good for mixed audience. <laughs> He says, when the curtain falls, uh, they will be standing out, out in the open by themselves and alone, and no one will be standing there to protect them. Uh, just, just ask uh, Andy Fastow uh, how he felt about that. You know? um, that's kind of what happened to him. Uh, this is actually the truth here. The only thing we have in this business is our reputations. It really is. It's the only thing you got. You might think you have a degree and all that, but really all you have is a reputation. It takes years to build it and minutes to destroy. You need to really think about that hard. It's a very important thing. Uh, if, you, if you lose your reputation, people just won't work with you. Um, I add a little bit to this. Um, I hear that orange is the new black, but uh, this is the part my dad told me. He says, Remember this, he says, you want to keep your pinstripes, I wrote this just for this, this slide here. Uh, you want to keep your pinstripes vertical, not horizontal. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I guess here in Texas, we make them wet, wear white, but in, uh, at Angola Prison, they, they wear horizontal stripes. Same thing in Ohio. Just ask Jeff Skilling. He's, oh, sorry. He says, see, the, was the CEO of Iran. I think he's feeling like he blew it. Oh, there's my wife talking to me. <laughs> I love this. She put that together for me. So here we are. What is business ethics? <laughs> I know many of us believe that business ethics were laid out by uh, Nikolai. <laughs> Machiavellia. I don't know. Are you familiar with this book? Anybody know what I'm even talking about? How many people know what I'm talking about? How many people have read this book? Twice. Oh, yeah. I've read it, too. Yeah. How many of the people that have read this felt you've worked for this guy at some point in time? <laughs> right. Right. Well, Nikolai Machiavellia he wrote a book called The Prince. That's what I was holding up here. You know I've read it because I, I found this on my bookshelf. For this talk. Uh, he, he wrote this for uh, Lorenzo Medici. The Medici family owned the area near uh, Florence. He claimed he never read it. That's a good doc. Good, I, I, even if it was written for me and I read it, I would have claimed I hadn't read it. Because when you read this, it's. Whoop. Yep, right here. This is just my favorite here. It is necessary for the prince who wishes to hold his own to know how to do wrong. Ooh, that sounds just evil. I dumb it down to any means to an end. We've met those people. It's, a, it's not a great philosophy or plan to go through. OK, I'm on 14. Good. Making, making progress. Modern day business ethics. Understanding ethical frameworks for decision making. Okay, um, this is where we're going with this thing. I, I learned a lot about this. Okay, and and I did get this information from Harvard Business School material. Where did I go? Oh, what wrong did I do? I'm pushing the wrong button here. Somehow I jumped ahead. Oh, wrong way. There we go. Here we go. Why do we care about ethical frameworks? People might ask that question. Well, they allow us to explore the full range of ethical themes associated with decision making. They help us understand the assumptions and associated with the ethical themes and therefore our own assumptions. And really, only after we've explored all that 
and reflect on it and scrutinize it, we can, uh, we can uh, reinforce and revise our ideas about it. The three ways to think about ethics, and therefore morality in this picture, in, the, in, in this framework here, this way of doing it, there's a descriptive ethics where you basically describe the moral beliefs and convictions of an individual or group or whatever. And you make no assumptions about the validity of those beliefs. You just simply describe it, and that's it. Metaphys meta ethics. <laughs> the goal here is to analyze the moral beliefs and convictions, gaining a deeper understanding of meaning and justification of them. <clears throat> Normative ethics. This is a question where we're trying to answer what are the general and specific convictions about right, wrong, good, bad, virtue, vice, and how do we, what do we hold and reject in that? That's the one that we're going to focus on in this. <coughs> Here's an example to give you an idea how to kind of think about this. For Americans, bribery is wrong, but for others, not so, if you have that statement. If you looked at it from a descriptive point of view, we would be saying the speaker is claiming there is a difference in the moral belief across societies. Whereas if we looked at the meta-ethics way of looking at it, the speaker is saying something about a lack of objectivity or cross-cultural ethical standards. But if we look at it from a normative point of view, the speaker is expressing a conviction about the moral unacceptability of bribery, at least for Americans. So that's kind of that way of thinking about it. Now, th there's three ways, three levels of applications for ethics and, their, and therefore morality, okay? And so I'll, I'll wander through that. Uh, there's systematic, an example of that is capitalism is a system that may or may not confer virtues or vice on the organization that comprises it. Oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. Organizational, organizations compri comprise capitalism, they're part of it, and they may or may not be conferring virtues or vice on the individuals who work for those organizations. And then you have personal, person that works there at an organization may or may not confer virtues or vice, and this is going kind of the opposite direction, organization. So it, it goes up and down. You can either go up the scale or down the scale. So if you want to look at it from a visual point of view, it kind of looks like this. We have descriptive on one side, analytical on the other, normative ties to take the mid middle road, and then we have the ethics of people, organizations, and systems, and we can go up and down that way. So this is kind of a layout of how we're going to look at things as we move along here. Sorry, I, I, I had to put the number of the slide on here so I can keep track of where I am. Uh, I'm trying to make this go for one full hour. <laughs> So, here we go. Okay, so yeah, the descriptive is on one side. Sorry, I jumped ahead. I forgot I had animated this. And uh, now we're going to connect ethics to decision making. You know, there's one style that is gut feeling or inspiration. Okay, I just use my gut feelings for doing this. There's a second style that's of testing right and wrong. Come up with some sort of a community consensus here. And then there's a third style to develop a set of principles and frameworks, using these to make that as a guide to help you make ethical, consistent ethical decisions. Really, is what it's about. That's the one we're going to focus on. But you can you, you don't want to throw out the other two uh, because the the group of this using them all together is defined as reflective equilibrium. So we're focused on the third one, but we can use gut feel and, and, the, and the tests of right and wrong and community census, consensus in the, in the whole thing. So this is kind of how the picture goes together here. You have theoretical, perceptual, ideological, and when you put them all together it's called reflective equilibrium. So yeah, normal, normal, uh, normative ethical theory 
is an inquiry into the basic principles that underlie our personal and conviction, conventional moral reasoning. The inquiry is carried out in the hope of cover, uncovering sound ethical principles that have prescriptive force, i.e. we're trying to come up with a model that allows us to be consistent and follow through with the same kind of decision making as we go through this thing. So the idea here, can a single formula capture moral point of view and is it only approximate or even valid or only valid? I think we need a break. It's getting pretty pretty thick there. I love this picture. I love this. This is the Dolomites along the Italian uh, um, Austrian border. I wish I was a person who took that picture because I want to go there. That person knows that. She's over there laughing. Uh, but it's a great picture. I, I had to put these geology pictures in here because this is just too much if you continue along. <laughs> too much. Anybody here been to the Dolomites? Uh, I mean, is it better than the picture? Uh, John, you hear that? We need to go. We need to go. All right. Telological frameworks. Okay, this is round one. Consists of two paradigms. The first is a sing it's a single formula can capture a moral point of view. Telos means any. You have the two sides of it. One side is ethical uh, ethical egotism, egotism or egoism. Person ought to act only to promote themselves herself for the greatest good over bad results. I.e., look out for yourself, and that's it. Hmm. It's a little challenging there, isn't it? And then you have the other end of that spectrum, which is called ethical utilitarianism. A person should only act to promote the maximum net acceptable utility for the widest community affected by their action. Greatest good for the greatest number. Right? That's kind of like the end of the spectrum there. And now you have, uh, you know, if that's the only thing you have, is to, let's just go back one. Yeah, if you go back one. Yeah, if this is all you have here, is you just have one end or the other, it's a little challenging, right? Yeah, I mean, there's places where there's got to be some give and take in between there. And that's where this guy, I'm going to mispronounce his name, I'm going to call it, is it Sidge Wink? Is that right? She's smiling. I think I got it. Okay. It's called Sidgwick's dualism. He was uh, a late 19th century philosopher. I told you I don't have a degree in philosophy, so I, I had to learn all this stuff before I got up here. Um, yeah, Henry. He, this is what he he said that uh, it was easy to see those two approaches are opposite ends of the spectrum, right? Either myself or everybody else. And he's going, well, you know, that's, that's a challenge. I'm in it for myself. Maximize the greater good of the tribe. He, he tried to resolve this conflict. And he basically came up with what he called the concept of maximum rational benevolence. How many people understand where I'm going at this point? Basically, this allows you to make a decision that is harmful, harmful for you and good for others. So. There you go. An example of that is, you know, we're, we're, we're in bad times, you know, people getting laid off all over town, you know, is uh, somebody who's older and later in their career realizing that they could volunteer to leave and that their, their leaving would, uh, would allow probably two people to work. <laughs> They're already a little younger than that. Uh, so that, there you go, that allows you to make a decision that is harmful to you but, uh, but good for the others. So you can, you can put this together kind of uh, in a triangle here, and uh, where you have egotism, utilitarianism, and Sidwig's dualism down there at the bottom tip, because it allows you to blend these two ideas. And a classic example from that, most of these uh, are political right and left. And I'm not saying I'm one way or the other on this, I'm just using this example. Um, but uh, take, for example, proponents of a strong government hand in regulations of private sector versus those who demand less government for regula uh, regulating uh, commitment to, prof to 
profit maximization with a commitment to profit maximization and competitive advantage. Sigwood's dualism is described as the invisible hand that will reconcile the social forces with the market system, thus reconciling the two end members. <clears throat> If you listen to CNBC and know who Larry Kudlow is, he's always a big one on the invisible. In every other sentence, the invisible hand will solve all this. But we'll see. So that's uh, that's this one. That's this, this time frame. Right? There is the invisible hand. Everything, it's not that invisible, but everything is balanced out in that. The next one, dentalot. Deontological frameworks. Yes. I tell you, this was philosophy, didn't I? I was a math and science major, so I don't know much about this. It consists of two paradigms again, um, uh, one that suppresses that uh, single imperative can capture moral point of view. Deon means duty, obligation. So that breaks out to uh, ethical, ex, ex, I can't even say the word, existentialism. Uh, the fine, what that means is, is that the person making that decision has is the final arbiter of right and wrong, and they have free will to make that decision, and they and they have been decreed with this, and so they don't have to feel bad morally or anything. They just are allowed to make any decision they want. Okay, whole different way of looking at it. And then the other one is contract Arianism, where you have uh, the overriding idea of this is, is the framework of fairness. So you can see that with the one, it wouldn't really be that fair. The guy's just, whatever he wants to do, he makes that decision and, 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 and you can't question it because he's just, that's, he's allowed to make any decision he wants. And the other one is this overriding thing of whatever decision you make needs to be fair. It needs to be fair. I always have a little bit of trouble with that. I tell my daughter there's nothing fair in this world, but uh, maybe there's another one coming up here that'll cover that. <laughs> another geology break, because I was getting a little heavy there. This is in Ireland. I haven't been here either. I haven't been to any of these places except for La Popa. I think I got the bad one, didn't I? Um, but this is the Ross Sandstone uh, Ireland trip. Um, a great picture. I really like it. Have you been on that one? Yes. You know, if, if you take those Nautilus courses, you got when that when that thing comes out, you got to jump on it that day, or they're all full. They're all full. I never do that. I was like, oh, that might be fun. And I go and look at it a week later, and they're all filled up. Okay, here's Kant's ethic. I knew we had to have one that blended these guys together. He was a 18th century philosopher, Immanuel Kant. It's easy to see these two are both opposite ends of the spectrum again. Extensionism, I am the legislator of moral value. That's like being a, it's kind of like being a shape or a, a ruler, a, a monarch. They used to, I said shape because I spent a lot of time in the Middle East. That's what they do. They, they, they're just an arbitrator between people that are having conflict. Uh, and then you have contractism, which is uh, decision making by, guided by principles anyone and everyone would agree with. He tried to resolve that conflict with, uh, with uh, act only according to the maxim, maximum by which you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. That's a, little, that's a little heavy for me. Um, so you want to act so you treat uh, humanity, whether in your own person or in that of others, always as an end, but never as a means. Okay, always as an end, but never as a means. You don't have to be going too fast, but you're both up fine. Okay. So you can put this again into another triangle. Love those triangles. Uh, with uh, extension, how do you pronounce that word? Existentialism and contractarianism up there at the top and can't try to pull them together at the tip of that triangle. Again, classic example of this is uh, 
proponents of a strong, visible hand in government policy towards business often appeal to contractism as concepts of social justice. While defenders of the invisible hand, I would be Larry Kudlow. Uh, existentialism also invokes fairness arguments <coughs> as well as the core ideas of freedom and individual rights. Free product markets, free labor markets are justified. <coughs> Excuse me. By uh, reference to respect for persons, that such arrangements arrangements imply for that. Ooh, what did I just? Well, that's it. So now we're going to move on to mixed frameworks because if you haven't caught on, <coughs> these two different frameworks I just showed are almost at opposite ends of the spectrum than themselves. Uh, so you've got this thing going on here. They're both on opposite ends. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, Glenn. Put that where I won't kick it over. All right, mixed frameworks. Okay, it consists of approaching normative ethics that try to unite early, the earlier two frameworks we reviewed, attempting to find a more basic touchstone that results in or motivates our motives to ground our judgment of right and wrong. Institutionalism, a set of principles or prima facie obligation that guide our decision making. And the other end of it is love or agapism. Agape meaning love in Greek. Uh, love thy neighbor as thyself, or perhaps be more humanistic. Okay? Institutionalism, prima facie. One, this is a list of rules, okay? One ought to keep explicit and implicit promises understood to include truth telling, that is, an implicit promise made entering into communication with someone. One ought to make reparations for previous wrongful acts. Show gratitude for service done by or by others. See the just distribution of goods. See to that. Make sure everything's doled out fairly in this. Do what one can to improve the lot of others. Improve one's own condition in respect of virtue and intelligence. Don't injure other people. So this is this is this group of rules here that they, they came up for. I, I don't understand why these ones, not some others, but this is what they kind of focused in on. I think that's one of the criticisms of it, is how did you come up with that group of rules? Then you have the love ethic. This one here re represents institutionally just incorporates uh, some of the prima facie duties. Uh, which haven't which been listed already. The main difference, though, is uh, it lies in its appeal to an effective as opposed to an intellectual foundation for both the inventory of duties and conflict revolution, uh, resolution that may be needed among them. And of course, you know, we had to have one, that little piece at the tip of the triangle again, because they love triangles in this century must be something that philosophers like the triangle. Uh, do, <laughs> that's called a tertiary diagram. It's different. Uh, duty as God's will. That's the, that's the tip of the triangle. And what this means is that, that probably this is one many of us are familiar with, is a moral point of view that's pursued in religious studies. It's by divine commandment. That's the Ten Commandments. There's that. It's central to the representation of Judeo-Christian as well as Islamic heritage. You know, in that case, it's Sharia law. Uh, uh, it usually is expressed by pointing out attributes of God's nature as benevolent uh, and justice and mercy. Yeah. Okay. Still got another ten slides. Got to go a little slower. I know, I memorized that part of it last night. 
duty is God's will. When the moral point of view is pursued in religious studies or theology. Oh, didn't I just do this one? Yeah, sorry about that. I must have. Oh, the bottom one. Divine command theory implies actions and norms get the legitimacy from being in accordance with God's will and no other source. There you go. I like that. We realize that may take us a while to internalize these. I feel that way about this talk. <laughs> oh, there we go. Another excellent photo by my good friend. These are lobes in, the, in, the, in, that, in that outcrop there, but the, the best part is that they're in Chile. Man, you have got a fast finger to sign up to those novelist courses, Miss Miley. Because <laughs> you've been on almost every single one of them. Uh, what a great photo. Was Hunter with you when you took this? Yeah, that's what it's on. Chile. We're in Chile. Very southern. The very southern part of Chile. Okay. This is my, my photographer friend is sitting over here. She's my good buddy. My, she's my protege from Ithaca and Anadarko. When they get mad at her, they can blame me. Okay, we can put this into the famous triangle, but this time we've rotated it 180 degrees. So we have institutionalism, love ethic, divine command theory. Uh, that's what we said. Okay, so we first use a single set, uh, a single principle or set of principles, explicitly defining an ethical framework. Second, we use a process of weighing provisional principles that may concurrently apply to a given decision-making situ situation. The second approach is essentially essential to the mixed framework described since each depends upon some form of weighting process, intellectual, emotional, or spiritual, and each claims to have some measure of objectivity or to personal validity. So this how it all goes together right here. Boy, that's it. <laughs> how many of you guys expected that? <laughs> I didn't either when I got to the end of the paper, but um, this is how they laid it out uh, right here. That, that this shows you that the theological, uh, the, the theo, yeah, I guess it's theological, and the dentatological are on opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, you have egotism, where it's everything for myself, or unitarianism with Sedgwick's dualism, and then on the other side, you have the extensionalism, contractism, and Kant's ethic. And then on the bottom, you have uh, the mixed group where you're trying to combine these two different styles of decision making uh, using these other things here, institutional love ethic or the like. But the concept here is, is that with this model here, you can go in here and you can start making decisions. And if you're really struggling with those decisions, you can go to something like this and you can try to keep some level of consistency in what the heck you're doing. To me, I think that's the biggest problem. Um, you, you may not be happy with the decisions you have to make, but the, the goal is to be consistent. So, multiplicity in the moral point of view. As you can see, these styles are thinking about morals at the end of the spectrum, or at the end of the spectrum, this is just exactly what I said a minute ago. One's driven by a kind of per impersonal way of looking at right and wrong and taking measure of goods, util maximizing utilities, okay? So it's everything for myself or making sure everybody has something. The other involves a more personal perspective, true to freedom and dignity. It's been suggested that we may transcend the distinction between these two by understanding each. Okay. Need to slow down just a little bit more here. Uh, we ask ethical questions whenever we think about how we should act. Being ethical is part of the, this, what defines us as human beings. And in a nutshell, ethics is about hmm, relationships. It is. Struggling to develop a well-informed kind of conscience. Being true to the idea of who we are and what we stand for. I think that's that part about a reputation. Have the courage to explore difficult questions. 
accepting the cost of doing what we're thinking, what we think is right. Asking one simple question, what ought I to do? Oh boy, this is where I'm headed. <laughs> when I can't make a decision and I don't know what to do, I'm going to call these guys. They're going to tell me what to do. Oops. <laughs> Dawn. <laughs> This, this, this actually does, these guys actually do exist. They're, you'll have to go out and get your own phone number. I'm sorry about that. But these guys actually exist. Um, so yeah, we need, we need to. When we put the slide deck out on the HGS website, we'll have the right phone number. Because I'm going to need it. Why ethics training? If you haven't guessed, I'm really concerned about not filling out the full hour because then you're going to ask me questions and find out how little I actually know about this subject. <laughs> Employment requirement. Yes, I have that happen to me in my office. Every year I have to do foreign corrupt practice, the British version. You guys familiar with the British version of that? It's way more onerous than the U.S. version. I don't even know why we'd mess with the U.S. version of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. We need to just follow the British one. British one is just in the night if I'm having a dream and I think about being corrupt, they can put me in prison. But really, really, it is about what it breaks down to. If you've read that thing, it's amazing. Okay, professional license to say, oh, that's me. I got how many people in here are doing this because of that? Yes, we're all doing it. I'm glad that the HGS is able to provide us with this opportunity. Personal development. That's why I'm standing up here in front. <laughs> oh, I love this cartoon. Might have been unethical that I took this. Yeah, I should have thought of that before I showed it. I love this. I mean, read this thing here. That last panel is like classic. Luckily, I haven't taken the training myself. Gilbert. You know, if my dad was here, he'd say, common sense just ain't that common. He loved that line. He loved that. He, that. he was the first guy to walk like an Egyptian, too. He had several things. I, he was quite a, quite a guy. I know that I can't even ask me questions. Current ethical issues. A couple more slides left. Oh boy, we're going to have to spend a lot of time on these ones. Okay, she said roll it up. You may need a manager who needs to cut their staff. That's an ethical dilemma. I would have a very hard time with that. In fact, that's the reason that I've always been a prospector. Once you've been in battle and been wounded and survived, I have at least two, no, three Purple Hearts. Uh, uh, you can't do that to somebody. It's very hard. Uh, I, I, my heart goes out to those guys. Hopefully these frameworks will give you some uh, insight on how to make this decision in a logical and consistent manner. It may be a surviving employee. It hasn't gone off in your head yet. That little light bulb ought to be going off right about now. <laughs> I'm not competing with Shell anymore. I'm competing with the guy next door. It's like that old stadium, you know, two guys are in the woods and the bear comes after him, the one guy stops down, ties his shoe, and he goes, what are you doing? There's a bear after you. He goes, I don't have to beat the bear, I just gotta beat you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just gotta beat you. Yeah. Hopefully you'll think twice before committing unethical acts towards your fellow teammates. For example, usurping their work, stealing their ideas, stabbing them in the back. <laughs> in front of the boss. I mean, why do I say these things? Did I tell you I've been in this business 35 years? Gosh, I remember the 80s. And it wasn't John Travolta I'm thinking of. It, was, it wasn't pretty. That's exactly what's going on now. Just a slow motion. Back then they had 15 million barrels to dump onto onto uh, a day excess resource to dump onto the market. This, this time they only had two million. 
hopefully it won't take as long. It was 14 years to get out of it the last time. My friend came to my office and showed me that. I said, thanks for nothing, Roy. More prior to ethical issues. Your company needs a loan to avoid bankruptcy. Remember, the ends don't justify the means, so be honest about your resource calculations and accounting. After your farm out presentation, interested company asks for 55 seismic images to show their management. Oh boy. Dawn, have I been talking in my sleep? <laughs> Gosh, that's like me. What can we say? We all know the biggest problem in our business seismic data, it's the lifeblood of it. But, you know, there's very little data that's proprietary anymore. It's all licensed data, all has rules. You need to read those rules, follow them. If we don't have seismic companies, we can't work. Here we go. We're at the light at the end of the, the end of the rainbow here. This is chilly again, isn't it? Where were we, Monica? Now, this is a fabulous photo. I need to go here. At least it's out of Houston. <laughs> Which is it hasn't been too pleasant lately. Alrighty, I think I've got five minutes left to answer questions. What that wraps us up. That's been one hour, guys. Thanks for putting up with it and uh, enjoyed it. I hope you had as much entertainment out of it as I did uh, uh, putting it together. Well, thank you, John. Uh, you, you brought up some good points here, and we'll have to all go back and think: Are we being ethical? Are the people we work with being ethical? <laughs> And what do we do about it, right? All right. It's <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for Thanks. coming. See you at the next meeting. Thank you. I don't want to have a, a presidential moment. What do you think? Did that do okay? You did wonderful. Okay. I love This is that. my buddy. I know. Sure. Thank you. 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 I forgot to say I'm looking for people <laughs> who might be going to Calgary. Yeah, I, I want to share a room. Oh, okay, yeah. I don't know, maybe my wife will go with me. We're both not working. Oh, yeah, even if you are working, you ought to go. It's like a week of vacation.